Razer's Blade line of laptops are undoubtedly popular, and to an extent I can see why. They're certainly, they certainly feel like the, the Apple of gaming PCs, and they definitely look like a black unibody MacBook, and certainly feel premium too. But for me, they always feel like they have a bit of an identity problem. They can't work out if they want to be a thin and light ultrabook, or the, the world's most powerful gaming PC, at least with this spec anyway. So let's take a look at it, see if it's worth your money and how it performs. But first, if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the model I have is the Blade 15 Advanced with the 10875H 8 core, 16 gigs of RAM, one terabyte SSD, and the RTX 2080 Super Max Q. It also comes with the absolutely stunning 1080p 300 hertz display. Yes. 300 hertz, it's amazing, but we'll get to that. Spec-wise, this is as clapped out as you can get, and for the privilege, you'll be parting with a whopping 3,100 pounds, fitting it squarely in the premium category, although, to be fair, you do get a very premium experience for it. Part of the identity problem I mentioned is uh, shown in the performance. This is, like I said, meant to be an RTX 2080 Super, but you actually get more like RTX 2070 performance. Let's take a look at the benchmark results and you can see what I mean. So starting off with Battlefield 5, this was tested at ultra settings just like the rest of the games and the average FPS we're seeing here is 105 with a pretty good 1% load of 94, so a very nice playing experience. Of course this doesn't quite uh, keep up with the 300Hz or 300FPS that the display would like, but this is all at higher ultra settings, same for COD 108 average with uh, round it up 82FPS as your 1% low. All of these were a very good, very nice playing experience, but if you did want to make use of that display, you would definitely want to turn these settings down. As for PUBG, testing on the, the new and improved Sanok map, this was 106 FPS average with a 1% low of 84, so again, a very enjoyable, pl a good playing experience, and of course, Fortnite tends to be a bit better optimized, and so you do get 134 FPS on ultra settings here. This was in DirectX 11 mode uh, and with multi-core rendering enabled, and again, a good 1% low of 86. To give you a rough idea, the MSI GE65 that I reviewed a little while ago now, which had a full fat RTX 2070, offers the same or better performance than this RTX 2080 Super, admittedly the Max Q version. The problem? It's ultra thin design. Seriously, this thing is no thicker than the USB type A ports that are on the side of it. And that means that the very impressive vapor chamber cooling system has to work overtime to keep the inferno of the CPU and the extra inferno of the GPU cool. Now it does manage to do that. The maximum temperatures I saw here uh, were around 95 degrees Celsius for the CPU and around 75 degrees Celsius for the GPU. So certainly within their standard target ranges for those parts. But the thing is that the performance you get from those parts, that the CPU did actually thermal throttle during testing, and the GPU is clearly hamstrung by a limited thermal budget, meaning that it can't push itself or even you know, have its TDP pre-configured to be high enough to actually match even a, a full fat RTX 2070 laptop model. So if you are dead set on picking up a Blade 15 with the 300 hertz display, I would personally go for the 2070 Super variant as you're likely gonna get similar performance with a better thermal budget available and you're gonna save yourself around 500 pounds on the asking price. Now I should mention that while the cooling solution does keep the CPU and GPU relatively cool, at least enough to get some reasonable performance out of them, the whole laptop, especially the under panel, gets to burn you within minutes temperatures very quickly. I saw around 50 degrees Celsius when testing on a desk, and so that's a very, very uncomfortable gaming experience if you're trying to game on your lap. I would also mention that the top plate of the keyboard, especially the top side of the keyboard near the display, got to around 45 degrees Celsius, so I would make sure you steer clear of that area while gaming too. I should also note that during my testing of the machine, I was given a BIOS and Synapse update that allows for uh, the selection of a boost tab or boost setting in the performance tab 
in Razer Synapse software, which gave me, I think, a 30% or so performance improvement in CPU bound workloads over the default medium settings for both the CPU and GPU that goes uh, that's preset when you get this out of the box. So I highly recommend you, if you do pick one of these up, go into Synapse, hit the performance tab and set the settings to either high or boost, depending on what's available. Now, speaking of CPU bound workloads, I was interested to find out how the eight core 10875H that's in this compares to the newer Ryzen 4000 CPUs that are available in some other thin and light laptops like the Zephyrus G14. So let's take a look at some results. Taking a look at the BM W render in Blender, this was a fairly impressive result. Obviously, more cores and in theory better clock speed means a pretty pr a good performance advantage over the 9750H, but still not quite as good as the new Horizon chips. The same can be said for Cinebench single thread, where again, you get a very good increase over the 9750H, but still not quite catching up to the Ryzen 4800H and 4900HS, which isn't to be surprised, especially considering its turbo boost behaviors, especially in the chassis. And again, the same you said for Cinebench multi-thread, where you do get a good performance advantage over the 9750H, but still actually a pretty big performance delta compared to the Ryzen chips, which is to be expected. Now, as you saw from the gaming results, the GPU, at least at ultra or high settings, can't really push any games to really make use of the 300 hertz display. So you will want to turn down settings if that's something of interest to you. And honestly, it should be. The gaming experience in this was just absolutely phenomenal. It was so, so smooth. I, I can't even describe how much of a pleasurable experience it was to be playing games on this panel. Even taking a look at some high speed footage, uh, as you can see, if you look at the slide uh, of the, the top of the gun, how smoothly that slides back after it's recoiled, it's just incredible. Here is a 144 hertz display doing the exact same test and you can see how much more juddery that is by comparison. That is just a, one example of just how incredible incredibly smooth this thing is and it's such a nice gaming experience. Now looking at some actual test results, the footage you just saw was from testing the input lag or total system input lag. So from the light on the mouse going out to the gun firing on screen. And this laptop took just 25 milliseconds to do that, which is a new record. It's the lowest I've seen on a laptop and even close to the lowest I've seen on monitors in general. So massive thumbs up there. What's even more impressive though is the response time. Two milliseconds. Legitimately two milliseconds black to white, which I suspect would correlate to about a legitimate one millisecond gray to gray response time, which is honestly phenomenal. And again, the lowest I've seen on pretty much any display full stop. Now the release time going from white to black does take a little bit longer, closer to 10 milliseconds, but as you would expect from a panel of this caliber, there is no ghosting at all. It's smooth and crisp pretty much no matter what you do. And honestly, the news just gets better from there. Testing with my Datacolor Spider X, the panel reported 99% sRGB coverage and 76 and 77% of the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 spectrums uh, respectively, which would be amazing to see on a 60 or 144 hertz laptop, but to see it on a 300 hertz laptop, that's just insane and makes this a fantastic content creation machine alongside its gaming premise too. As for the rest of the bits that you interact with, so the keyboard and trackpad, they're pretty decent. The keyboard is a fairly low key travel style, which I'm not personally quite a fan of, but after a pretty small adjustment period, I was very happy both gaming and typing on it with pretty much no problems. The same can be said for the trackpad. It is massive and possibly the best that you can get on a Windows machine by a good margin. The IO is all right as well. You have three USB type A ports, two USB type C ports, one of which is a Thunderbolt three ports. You also have their bi-directional charging ports, which 
is proprietary and you also have HDMI and an SD card reader. No ethernet here, but you do have incredibly fast Wi-Fi, so that's normally a good compromise. The battery life can vary depending on your usage. It's an 80 watt hour unit, which generally speaking serves to give good enough battery life for most usage. It depends on things like your screen's refresh rate and brightness quite a lot, and also it depends on what you're doing. So for example, with a screen set to 300 hertz and full brightness, you're gonna be looking at about two to three hours of web browsing use. Whereas if you say set it down to more like 60, just for, you know, web browsing, that kind of thing, and lower the brightness a bit, you can squeeze that to more like four to five. One thing I should mention is the storage, which in this configuration, you can only pick up with a one terabyte SSD. Now it is a Samsung PM981 drive, which is a, an M.2 NVMe drive, although not the fastest, but luckily it is upgradable. It's a standard drive that you can just unscrew, as is the RAM. And honestly, I would recommend you probably do that, as for this caliber of machine, I would really like to have seen two or four terabyte options, at least available, even if they were extra cost. So what's the verdict? Like I said, the identity problem means that you get a fairly hamstrung GPU, a stunning display that you might have trouble pushing enough frames to, a thin and light but blisteringly hot chassis that still has the sharp edges that cut your wrists every time you try and type or game on it, but offers a truly premium feel and experience at a truly premium price. This isn't a bad machine, far from it, but it's definitely for a niche that I don't think I'm in. I certainly wouldn't stop anyone from buying one of these. It's a capable and competent machine that can deliver really good performance if you can keep it cool and obviously keep it on a desk as you wouldn't want to be touching this thing. But I would generally recommend, like I said, going with the 2070 version instead uh, to save a bit of money and potentially get very similar performance and maybe upgrading the SSD and RAM later if you want to make use of it for a more content creation machine uh, or just you know store more than like three games if COD is anything to go by. And with that said, those are my thoughts. I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the Blade 15 Advanced? What do you think of that beautiful 300 hertz display? Is this something you'd pick up? Is it too expensive for you? Anything at all, let me know in those comments down below. Now I'm gonna leave a link to the Blade 15 Advanced in the description down below so you can check it out. That will be on an Amazon affiliate link. It will take you to your local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and where you watch this. I'll also leave a link to Razer store directly if you wanna you know, prefer buying from them well, directly. And there's also a load of other links in the description you can check out, including a load of other affiliate links that you can use if you're buying from people like Overclock GK, or maybe you want a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or a load of other cool designs. There's also Patreon for ad-free videos and supporting me directly, and just a load of other stuff down there too. I'm going to leave some more laptop reviews over there, probably the Zephyrus G14, as that's the closest to this style of machine, a sort of thin and light and slightly hamstrung performance, uh, but uh, an incredible machine, fantastic for content creation, and still a pretty capable gaming machine too. Uh, but otherwise, that is pretty much it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below as well. Like I said, don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we will see you all in the next video.